think uh, I think I'm good to pass it over to our guest DM, which I'm super excited to introduce because guess what? I fell in love with D and D, um, in part because of this guy. Uh, he was my first DM. So uh, emotes in chat for uh, for Kiffer. Oh, Go ahead, they, Kiffer. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to run this. I'm really excited. Love all these guys. Love all these players. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, should we do a quick round of introductions? I feel like most of you everyone knows, or everyone knows most of you rather. Um, but a quick round just to make sure everyone's on the same page. I know everyone knows Paul, obviously. That's why you're here. Yeah. Come see that pretty face. Uh, we have Olivia. We have Bree, a newcomer to the stream, guest like myself, uh, and the rest of your three regulars, Marissa, Laura, and Dave. Wave hi. Alrighty, uh, if we had a title sequence, this would be where we'd run it. But <laughs> failing that, I say we just get started. <laughs> Shall we? Alright, we can put the title sequence in uh, in post. <laughs> we got it in post. <laughs> Something stirs in the night. It's a night of a long age. A slumbering giant of yesteryear laying its head down to give way to the rising world of science, of discovery, of pushing limits and denying one's mortality in the face of the universe that, to many, appears more and more engineered to be careless and as cold as the night is long. The year is 1879. As terrifying as such things may be to some, others embrace it. After all, rising up to such challenges is a privilege of this new world, one which we have created one which has left behind the mud and the darkness of days long past. All of our squabbles, all of our fights, all of our struggles, ultimately, will raise humankind up from the darkness whence it came. Unless, unless we've forgotten something. Unless, in passing into a new dawn, we've forgotten the terrors of the night. In passing from one age to the next, we gain comfort and confidence, but we lose an understanding that has kept us alive until then. Deep down, beneath the veneer of inner peace and outer progress, we know. We know that some vestiges of the old world still slumber. Some sleep, some stir, and some rumble in the early stages of waking, and some older still watch, waiting to slip through the cracks to reduce the world to an expression of their will. As terrifying as the evils of this world may be, it's nothing compared to the dreams of those things that watch from the dark corners, waiting for their moment to bring about a different kind of world, a darker kind of world, a world where humankind's worst nightmares become their sweetest dreams, laid out at the feet of something that has been waiting for millennia. And with that, we'll start with our first character. Birds chirp on the windowsill. A quiet, sunlit morning painting the floorboards in a golden glow. A young woman, quiet in her work, finishes placing breakfast on a board to take upstairs. But something's missing. Alice, you reach for the tea, the English lavender, which your grandfather loved so much but you're out. Taking a pause, sighing the extra step in your morning process, reach out to grab the clippers, head outside into the early morning to go walk down the lane to where you know that flower, flower grows. The doctor's here on an early visit. He's got your grandfather taken care of for now. If you could describe your character for us. Can't hear you. Damn it. All right. Alice is a young 28 year old woman. She's got long blonde hair. She's got one blue eye, one brown eye. And she's uh, dressed in her lovely blue gown. You can see in the photo Olivia drew. Um, 
She's timid. She looks melancholy. She's just kind of going through the motions, it seems, as she's headed off to go retrieve this flower. You head out into the morning. It's cold, it's crisp. Late spring morning. You can always already feel the heat rising in the air. <clears throat> as you walk out of the house and head down the lane, past a few other houses in this neighborhood uh, on the outskirts of Charlotte. Um, you see a couple familiar faces, um, a couple women out collecting water, chatting as they are so wont to do uh, here in this neighborhood. That's just a bit too quiet. It's nice for you, but others, well, they have to find things to do. And as you've heard on many a morning and sort of expecting as you go, you can just overhear the neighbors Poor dear, she was never right in the head. I heard she nearly killed old Arthur in a fit. Poor man, still serves him right for what happened to his daughter. No wonder the girl isn't right. She just keeps her head low. In the back of her mind, she can kind of hear some grumbling, but she just kind of suppresses it, is ignoring as best as she can. You head down the lane, pass a few other eyes watching you, tracking you just a bit longer than they would for other neighbors, perhaps. Not knowing, just untrusting. You find the patch of English lavender. <clears throat> Pardon me. You find the patch of English lavender. Kneel down, careful not to muddy your dress. Cut a few, and you slip. Just a small cut. Single bead of blood drops out into a little mirror-like pool, one that you were avoiding with your knee. Left over from last night's rain. You don't want to, but part of you can't help it as you glance down. You see two brown eyes staring out at you from the liquid and a laugh <laughs> echoes through your ears. And then the vision's gone. Oh no. She just mumbled, mutters to herself. She's like frozen solid and suddenly the voice is getting really loud in her head. It's just saying like, let me out. Let's go. Let me out. <laughs> Can I let her out? I don't know. Up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say small enough at this point, Alice still is in control, should she wish it. Okay, I'm gonna say she stays in control. She just kind of shakes her head and she grab, um, squeezes the watch in her pocket really tight and she's just like closing her eyes and she's like shaking her hand off to the side, just ignoring it. Okay. Retracing your steps, binding up your hand in a strip of cloth um, such that it doesn't bleed anymore, you head back to the house. As you do, you notice the mailman seems to have been by in your absence, or perhaps you missed it on your way out, distracted as you might have been by crosstalk and nosy neighbors. But that's odd. The mailman's been by, and it's a Sunday. There's a single letter in the box as you drop the flag and open it up. There's no address. There's no return address. Just one line across the front of the envelope. Dr. Arthur Hardy. She glances at it and she's confused expression on her face because he hasn't gotten anything in quite some time, at least not from someone she doesn't recognize immediately. And um, she takes it inside and sets it down. But I'm going to say that she uh, puts on some gloves to handle the cut situation for a second. So she doesn't have to worry about that. Okay. So uh, you head back inside, <clears throat> reheat the water. You can hear the doctor moving around upstairs. Uh, as you finish breakfast, he <clears throat> comes down. Um, you can see a man in his middle years pushes two small glasses up his nose, uh, more a habit than a need to see. 
Well, I've seen better. Though I've seen him worse. Well, do, any idea what's going on? I'm afraid not. Other than, uh, <laughs> frankly, I has very little in the way of symptoms outside of uh, being uh, comatose and unresponsive, uh, as he often is. Just that uh, violet red tinge to the white of his eyes. Can't place it. Just seems off. Um, best bet, keep him comfortable. We'll wait to see if something develops. I'm going to send a few letters to a few friends and, you know, places where they do research on odd diseases and whatnot. Um, it's the best I can promise for now. Well, what do I do? How do I, how do I keep him alive? He's kept alive so far, so keep doing what you're doing. If there are any further developments, let me know. Uh, if there are any emergencies, then... Uh, Follow your instincts and send for me. But right now, um, your best bet is to pray and to hope. I encourage you to do both. He's surprisingly just really angry inside. But she nods. He uh, takes his hat from the rack and sets it on. Good day, ma'am. Steps outside, closes the door. I'm going to say she sheds a little tear a little bit. And then takes breakfast upstairs to him. Okay. Or, Walk up. yeah, tea, sorry. Tea and a um, small collection of fruit, soft eggs. Chewing is difficult. <laughs> Should you be able to convince him to eat it all? And stepping inside, you know immediately this is a bad day. You see him shivering in the bed despite piles of blankets and comforters. Eyes staring up at the ceiling. Weeping not from sadness, just from wateriness. Uh, the one symptom you've been able to pick out is just that odd tinge to the color of his eyes. Nothing overmuch, just odd. As you approach, doesn't seem to respond to you, doesn't seem to see you. But as you sit on the side of the bed, he, the shivering stops, he holds his breath, still staring at the ceiling. I'm just going to like say, come on, I'm trying to like prop him up a little bit so he can and maybe feed him, try to feed him, see if anything happens. He's never been a large man, and he's particularly thin now. Uh, it's easy enough to, if he can't muscle himself up, it's quite easy for you to do so. Um, in fact, it's almost like lifting a rag doll as you prop him up. It um, feels almost weightless to you. And it's easy enough to lift the spoon and get him to take a couple bites before he starts to move his head away, refusing the only way he knows how. And your first thought is, even if he could read, he's probably not in any shape to read that letter. I'm just going to leave the stuff and like get up and head down to the letter where it was back on the downstairs and open it up. Okay. You open it up. You see a fine hand writing in a very practiced script. Good day, Dr. Hardy. I hope this letter finds you well. You and I both know the pains of growing old, of the loss of useful, youthful vitality. And I can only hope and pray that the recent developments have found you improved since our last correspondence. The matter has arisen that requires immediate attention, and your expertise in matters darker than they should be. I would beg your attendance in Boston on May the 10th, the founding of the new Archaeological Institute of America. Should you be able to travel, I would greatly appreciate your help in this matter. I'm afraid there may be 
not so much thanks in it. And I cannot promise much in the way of a repair to your reputation as undeserved as it currently stands. However, I do believe that recent happenings might have a relation to the condition of your granddaughter. I hope that your expertise and knowledge in this matter may help us greatly, and perhaps may shed some light on her own condition in a way that leads to a solution for you both. With utmost respect, Professor C. E. Norton. And from there, we roll on for our next character. The music shift. Fog rolls in. Another wet, grey morning in Brent in the west of London. Beads of coalesced fog turn to rain on the edges of roofs to splash on the sl slick stone streets. They're yet silent at this hour, the barest crack of dawn. Only a handful of those unlucky enough to put off early waking are about. Sweeps, beggars, night guards, and the occasional early laborer heading to bakeries to begin their day's work. One walks alone amongst these, crisp boots snapping on wet cobbles. A private inspector, answering an emergency notice from the police station that his attention was immediately required. Dave, if you'd like to describe your character. Uh, yes, Clive Mason. It's uh, late 30s. Ish silvery vest, long coat, black pants, uh, brown hair, brown eyes, brown hair parted nearly in the middle. Uh, has carries a pipe as well. Um, yeah, generally stern features, serious look about him. Excellent. The early morning, uh, you're no stranger to that, or late nights. The only thing you might be a stranger to is sleep when you're busy enough. You keep an eye on those walking past you and an eye on your destination, or at least the path to it, winding through the streets to arrive at the address you were given. As you arrive, you notice a familiar sight, a police guard. They're always there before you. They call for you after all. They stand watch, two of them, around a dreary townhouse. It's overburdened with crawling vines and flowers drooping under the weight of the fog. Chief Briggs, a bit red in the face and huffing even at this early hour, uh, Z shifts himself towards you. It's a quick nod of greeting. Well, thanks for uh, making the early call. Um, mm. Glad you can make it. Of course. <clears throat> what seems to be the mystery incapable of solving this time? <laughs> well, it's a bit of an odd one. Um, odd enough that well, the boys are a bit nervous about this one. <clears throat> and uh, immediately there's a trepidatiousness to him. There's a shifting even more so than you're used to. I'm... Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just so you know, please don't be offended. I brought in a second consultant on this uh. one. He's a bit more out there than you are. Um, this one is abnormal enough to where mm, more eyes are better than, uh, than none. He just moved to Egypt, apparently, but he's from the motherland. He's a bit of an odd duck. Please don't take offense. I just want to cover my bases on this one. As he says that, you see an unfamiliar figure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, you see an unfamiliar figure step out uh, of the door. You can see cleaning his nails, looks up. Oh, uh, hello there. Y you must be uh, Inspector Mason. It, it, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, you see a, an older gentleman, short, um, balding hair. What he does have is slicked back, probably leaves it a bit too long, dressed all in white, uh, perfectly designed, perhaps for hot weather, uh, a white linen suit. Um, make 
either a perception or investigation check for me. First roll. Uh, well, let's just do my investigation. Then. First roll of the game, folks. Woo! All right. Um, let's go. That is, let's see, investigation 26. 26. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Level 12. Uh, immediately, you pick out a couple things. Just on a quick scan, doing what you do. Um, he's very fidgety, and he seems to hold his hands in a way that does not... Um, does not belie an ease. Uh, he seems to be, if not, if not nervous, then at least bordering on neurotic. Someone who is always processing thoughts, though he does seem to give off a calm demeanor. It's a bit of a dissonance, an immediate dissonance in your in your eyes. Um, the second thing you notice is a very odd shape, uh, an oversized necklace dangling down between the lapels of his jacket. Um, beneath the cravat that he wears. Um, it's a cross, but the top of the cross is looped. Um, it's bit, and it's a bit over large for a pendant. Sort of stands out prominently. Um, you see dust around his boots in swatches that seem like maybe it was too quick of a shoe shining, um, but a light tan dust that you are not familiar with. If indeed he is from Egypt, well, perhaps that's the dust. Um, and perhaps not. But given the information you have, that's a possibility. He it's, goes, shakes your hand, or goes to shake your hand. Uh, Clive reaches out his hand, appraisingly. <clears throat> yes, pleasure. You um seem a bit nervous. Come in a hurry, did you? Straight from Egypt. Uh, more or less. Um, my name is Eliphas Levi Zahed. It's a pleasure to meet you, uh, though I wish it were under better circumstances. Uh, shall we get to work, perhaps, now that we're here? Yes, it is what I came for. Excellent. And he spins on a heel decisively and heads back inside. Chief Briggs looks at you. I told you it was a bit out there. Odd fellow. I figure he and I should get along smashingly. Do you step inside, one foot on the doorway, one foot past it. As soon as you do, it hits you like a smack in the face. The smell of blood. And it's rank. You don't see it yet. And immediately that's a concern. If you don't see it, and you can smell it, there must be enough to carry to this room with no airflow. Hmm. Yes, um, well, the chief comes in behind you, squeezing through the door. I'll start off by saying, uh, it looks like she's turned the roof of her house into a greenhouse, except it ain't green no more. After you. Um, pliable step on through. You step through and wind up one doorway, or one stairway, up another and up a third until you appear at the top of that townhouse. And as you do, you step outside back into that morning. But somehow it feels colder on the roof than it did downstairs. And maybe, just maybe, it's the glass panes in front of you painted red from the inside. The door is already open. Another two guards outside of this one. Eliphas steps through without looking at you. Peering through and stepping in after him, you see perhaps the messiest crime scene you've ever come across. Blood lies scattered about the greenery, flowers of every color and leaves and vines of every shape spattered with dried crimson. What remains of an elderly woman, and immediately you can tell she's elderly, it's, she does have gray hair, or at least did, lies in the midst of it all, a rictus grip around a trowel and a small garden three-pronged pick each tipped with gore and skewering flesh. Innards lay outwards on the floor, exposed to sun for the first time as light begins to poke through the fogged glass overhead. Hmm. <clears throat> well, this is quite a grisly scene. That's just why we call you gentlemen, as 
Briggs sort of looks in and kind of chokes back down. Best we can tell, not to offend you, but to save you time, um, we seem to be unable to locate anything or anyone else. Um, we'll have the coroners... Excuse me. We'll have the coroners come in and do a full report, but uh, I want you to have first look, gentlemen, before this uh, hits the newspapers. That's quite. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and Clive will begin to investigate. Okay, go ahead and make an investigation check, and let me know if you're looking in for anything in particular. Um... Guess looking for um, I don't know. Uh, all right, that's a thirty. Thirty. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, woo! All right. Um, <laughs> you start your round a second after Elifas does, and Elifas seems to glide through um, the cuffs of his pants dragging through the red it seems that he doesn't even notice um there's a bit of a pooling sensation going on uh, you notice a number of things being you uh the first is uh the chief was right if there was anyone else involved there is no evidence of them it is a lot of blood but the human body does hold quite a lot of it um if anyone else's is here that's at least not enough uh to stand out uh from your best estimation She's the only one in here. Um, looking at the body or the pieces that are left, um, there are dismemberments, um, specifically on the lower extremities. Um, the wounds seem to be, have been done with that trowel and with that pick. Um, no other weapons seem to have been used, or if they were, they are similar enough to pass for the same. The grip upon the weapons, as you sort of pick at the fingers, is rictus indeed. It's one of the strongest you've ever come across. For an old lady who doesn't have the most strength in her arm, um, she has a grip that would rival that of a, you know, a, a, a large young man who works who labors for a living um this is a like a, if this was a handshake it would crush you elephas <laughs> stands up looks to you looks to the looks to chief briggs this is um <clears throat> this is um cult work this is the occult if i've ever seen it i think we can conclude uh, that as much, and we can go on from there. I will begin my investigations immediately, and I will uh, bill you as I see fit. Are we at McCorn? Chief oh. Briggs kind of looks at you and looks at him. I suppose. Excellent. Elephas steps past you, nods to you, nods to the chief. Good day. A cold walk. Do you wait for Elephas to leave, or do you uh, say that in uh, response to him? I'll say that in response to him. He pauses halfway out the door. Why, yes. What else could have driven a sane old lady to do such a thing to herself? <clears throat> How many psychological issues, any number that people may have, <clears throat> what makes you leap to a cold work? Psychological issues, you say? I mean, psychological issues lead to uh, drive the human being to quite fanatical choices, should they wish. Um, suicide, um, self-harm, of course. But to this degree, you do see that both of her legs have been sawn off, correct? Bone itself severed. Yes, quite apparent. Thank you. Excellent. Do you not think that the pain of such self-infliction would not mm, jar her out of it? 
Hmm. Well, psyche is a very complex thing, <clears throat> but occult. Um, are you saying this was under magical means or just? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm not called in on any job that has a mundane explanation. Isn't that why you're here as well? Hmm. Yes, to uh, dispel any myths of such and prove there is a rational, grounded explanation and the supernatural. As he, <clears throat> Eliphas takes a step back and walks closer to you. He's much shorter than you are, significantly. Uh, you could, he comes up to about your chin, but he leans up towards you. Words intended only for your ear. Inspector Mason, if I didn't know better, I would say you're afraid of the supernatural being weird. Hmm. Almost as if you've got a hang up. And Clive will just whisper back. <clears throat> it's a good thing you don't know any better then. <laughs> you may go. I will. Uh, Take it from here. He takes a step back. Thank you for your permission. I look forward to working with you in the future. Um, my friend sort of uh, scratches at the cross pendant and steps out the door, leaving bloody boot prints as he goes. Briggs looks at you. Do you... Um, <clears throat> kind of half gags again. Do you have enough to work with? I believe I have all that I need for now. Uh, where did you find this amateur? I do hope all investigators from Egypt are out of his caliber. Like I said, I'm just covering my bases. Hmm. Quite. I have all that I need. Thank you. You step out, head outside, able to have kept the blood off of your boots, not quite so crass on a, cli on a crime scene as Eliphas seemed to be. Um, as you head out, uh, a young boy approaches you, all on his own. You can see he looks down at a letter in his hands and up at you, and you know this boy. This is a, an informant of yours you've come across a number of times and have paid off in sometimes coins, sometimes sweets. Inspector Mason, um, this came for you. No. Oh. This is Al. Uh, you can see dark eyes under dark hair, um, sort of sunken hollow eyes. Uh, for such a young boy, it's odd he doesn't sleep all that much. Um, but dressed in fine clothes and dressed in, uh, in clean. Um, and he holds up the letter for you. This came for you. I'm, it just showed up on my doorstep, oddly. But I thought I should get it to you. Oh, another mystery to investigate, then. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, you. this is Mrs. Dawson's house. Mrs. Dawson, you say? Yeah. She, um... He looks it around at the police, and for a young boy of four or five, putting it together far too quickly. She was talking to herself angrily yesterday. She's not talking anymore now, is she, Mr. 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 Mason? No, I think she'll remain quiet for quite some time. Uh, <clears throat> do you know what she was saying to herself? It's like she was arguing with someone who wasn't there. Like she was bickering with herself while she was watering her flowers. It's about little things. Telling herself to shut up. No, you shut up. Hmm. That sort of thing. Psychological issues indeed, then. Thank you, Al. Oh, of course, here. And clever one. Reach into his pocket and pull out a coin and give it to him. 
He takes it eagerly, stuffing it away into a pocket um, with quick fingers. Thank you, Inspector. I'll, I'll keep my eye out, yes? Yes. Nonsense. Remain observant. I will. I, I have to get to school, I think, though. The, the nursemaid, she's um, told me I can't miss anymore. But I'll keep my eye out, I promise. Thank you. Good lad. Opening the letter, you read... Dear Inspector Mason, I regret that our correspondence has taken so many months to resume. I take full credit for not returning your last letter sooner, and regret that I must attribute recent developments in studies, both professional and private, as the primary culprits of my delay. It is regarding said private studies that I write you now in earnest. The tome you helped me recover several years ago has, unfortunately, gone missing. This is surprising, given the utmost security it has experienced since the day you were last in its presence. Such a disappearance does not happen accidentally. I am deeply concerned about the ramifications of such a theft, especially with recent developments the world over. There is hardly a corner of this green earth that hasn't felt its shadow, from whispers that have made it across the gap. I hear London has experienced much the same. I respect your healthy skepticism for the twilight world. Such undercurrents are subtle and often overcredited, as you know. I can only hope that such skepticism is, despite my fears, still warranted. I would greatly appreciate your assistance in the recovery of the aforementioned artifact and cordially invite you to Boston on May the 10th, the founding of the new Archaeological Institute of America to begin your investigations. In hope, Professor C. E. Norton. <clears throat> Same job twice. Well. Yeah. So I'll be taking a trip to the States. From there, I pass on to our next character. Several days later, though not too far in distance. Hushed whispers overtake the velvet draped quarters of a salon on the Upper East Side of London. Quiet patrons dressed in latest fashion attempt to keep aloof their excitement bleeds through in darting eyes and fidgeting fingers. Without warning, the door they've all been watching out of the corner of their eyes creaks open, revealing a thickly carpeted hall down to a half-open door at the end of a corridor. A veil of paper-thin black silk blocks a doorway, and a voice emanates from the interior. What does said voice say, Olivia? Come in. The first customer walks in, pushing the black silk out of the way. You can see an older woman, not a hair out of place, with a series of rings fine enough to purchase an estate, sits down across from you. And what does she see? She sees a uh very uh chaotic looking woman who is bordering on the unhealthy side of thin um she has very sharp cheekbones and a very long pointed nose and uh very large very dark black eyes that are sort of ringed with a bit of purple skin from lack of sleep. Um, she has like a huge mass of like unruly black hair that's sort of thrown up in like a Victorian-esque style. Um, and she's wearing like a sort of uh, translucent-y shift of a sort that's like very draped and scarves and velvets and her fingers all glint with lots of little like trinkety rings and she kind of jingles as she moves from like her earrings and her bangles banging against each other she sits behind her little table covered in like a purple velvet cloth sit she sits eyes open a little nervous as she kind of tries to look at you tries to face you but is trying to take in everything this is a a woman who perhaps not so unusual for you, is used to being in charge of her environment and now feels out of place. You are here to 
read the cards? Ye yes. I... I would like to know what to expect. I've had a trying time this last year, and... Well, guidance would be appreciated. Uh, go ahead and make a your choice. Uh, perception, investigation... Uh, I'll say perception or insight. Uh, perception would be going for anything uh, like a physical representation of any clues you can garner, or insight would be... Uh, insight. Insight, go for it. Uh, insight would be insight. I will sort of tap myself on the shoulder and a little whoosh, and spooky cold air blows by and give myself some guidance. Holy she can, you, <gasps> can you also like boost your mic just a little bit? More? Quiet again. I feel like I... Oh. Okay. Does that matter? Give us another sentence. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even fucking make that up. I cannot even make that up. Um. Anyway, that would be a 34 because I got a nat 20. Nice. Okay. Um, this woman is barely holding it together. Um, not unusual uh, for someone who you know, who comes to you um, from a position of power to a place and to a person that perhaps they would might be tempted to look down on outside of their realm of expertise. Mm. Um, you notice a few things. Uh, you notice red rimmed eyes. Um, and despite the presence of makeup, it does seem like certain areas, especially around the eyes, have been reapplied, almost as if mm. she's been crying. Um, despite her amount of rings, um, you can see she consistently, like, fumbles at her left ring finger, which is oddly ringless. Um, and you do also pick up that there are several threads of the wrong color that seem to have stitched a small tear at the seam of her sleeve. A woman like this, there's no reason she should have less no than ideal work being done. Clothes. Is there anything what what should I expect? Um, can, can you? Do I have any reason to to hope for oh, better? So there's always reason to hope. She's going to like fan out the cards in a very dramatic way, and she's going to say, "Please point to three of them." She hesitantly points towards one in the middle, one near the bottom, and then after a hesitation, one at the very top. <clears throat> uh, Pythia gives a very dramatic gasp. <gasps> what? What? What do you? What do you see? She like reaches across the table and grabs the woman's hand in her like kind of unnaturally long fingered hand and says, "You have had such a hard time. You have no idea. I do. The emperor. But what, it what is that, what does that mean? reversed." You have recently that? lost a prominent male yes, figure yes. in your life. Um, I'm going to cast Detect Thoughts. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Detect Thoughts. Are you pushing deeper or just going for surface? Just going for the surface thoughts. I just want to see if like any names pop up as, as I say prominent male figure. Uh, Im immediately just across is how did she know? Hmm. Um, this is real and sort of a self-confirmation um, and then Archibald oh, dear dear Archibald how, how, how did you know well, I did not the cards would tell me everything but that oh, is go okay on. what's the next one what's the, this what is, is in your past it has happened the worst is over it's a page of one and as she like pulls the card up, there's like a gold gilt on the illustration that kind of like shimmers and flashes a little bit. This is a very good card. This means you are on your way to greater things with much potential and creativity. But, but I don't feel like that. I'm not creative. I'm, 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 st I'm stuck. I don't have, I don't, 
I, I have no means. Is anything happening in her thoughts about being creative and lack of means? You can feel on the surface she's like scrambling, like wants it to be true, but can't think of what it would apply to. Um, based on your 34, we'll carry your 34 insight through here. Um, <laughs> she is... So that's wrong, I'm going to have this entire campaign. <laughs> I'm so mad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's appropriate though. Um, yeah. As she is, like, you can tell she wants it to be true. Most people, when they come to you, especially after you're able to, like, comfort them, calm them, and, like, find something to, to latch onto in, in speaking to them, they want it to be true. Hmm. It's going to be one of those tough ones. It's like, she wants it to be true, but what avenue? What, what you know, she, what, like, she's grasping for something. Is that not something your heart is drawn to? Now that this part of your life is over. A calling, a new destiny. But there's always things that all of us want to do, but it's a matter of whether you can or not. It's, I can't just... I have no talents, no experience. She kind of deflates. But this is not what the cards tell me. For your last card, it is the Knight of Swords. What does that mean? It means there's a great protector coming to you. Great protector? Someone who will take charge, drive you into the future. <laughs> See, like a realization on her face. What is she thinking now? She's remembering, it's like her immediate thoughts are back to like, Younger days, flash of like the first time she met Archibald, he wasn't interested in her. Yeah. <laughs> she kind of gets a smile on her face. There was one thing I was very good at. <laughs> I never thought of that as a creative act, but inserting oneself into the right social circles is a art. You said I'm supposed to meet a protector, someone important, someone Powerful. Yes. You should look for the sword. Look for the sword. Look for the sword. Perhaps. And then convince them that they need me. Yes. I can this do is that. your destiny. Oh. Thank you. Of she like course. reaches across and holds your hands in her or hand in her hands. I'd never thought of it like that before. The cards reveal on. <laughs> Thank you. She like goes to leave and immediately, oh, I'm so sorry. And then she like takes out uh, a set of pound sterling and just shoves them over to you, significantly overpaying. That is very kind of you. Thank you. No, no, thank you. I. Thank you. And she out the door. Oh, that was a tough one. And Not very specific with their thoughts. Well, I, um, uh, you never let me down before, mistress. I had no doubts in you. Well, you know, it, it, it is a bit of the cards. It is not all this just smoke and mirrors, you know. This is, this is, you know. And she, like, pulls out the page of wands and she's like, of course, that one is my card. I cannot do a single reading without it showing up. It's very frustrating. The, uh, ghost-like crow sitting in the rafters hops down onto the table and hops over to where the cards were laid out and as you shuffle them sort of pecks at them you know I wasn't expecting this particular pastime to last as long as it has is there not something more important you should have been doing perhaps I don't know last night an important meeting, perhaps you should have attended. I don't think so. That was the seance. No, in Kensington. He, he hops down onto your lap and pecks oh. at a mirror hanging from your coat. Shoot! Get off of that. You no, know, perhaps it off the, accidentally. Perhaps the reason that you were given this in the first place. 
You are very welcome to go if you wanted to go. I'm not holding you here. It does me no good to go without you. I don't have anything to say to them. Well, perhaps they have things to say to you. I'm just warning you. Perhaps your responsibilities are not something to shark as fun as it is convincing older, used to be wealthy women to seduce some unfortunate man. And there's no such thing as an unfortunate man. Well, I would consider myself somewhat unfortunate, but that's besides the circumstance. No, I, um, I wouldn't consider you very much of a man. Well, not anymore. Mm, tragic. I used to command respect. Now look at me. Mm. Sort of clicks his beak and hops up into the rafters as the next customer walks in. She like gets herself all spooky again. You cycle through. <laughs> <laughs> you cycle through um, at, a, at a decent pace, taking breaks where needed, not wearing yourself out, enjoying the process. Mm. As the last customer leaves for the day you stretch crack your back stand up probably the first time you have I think 14 other bones crack as she does that and like a little uncomfortably loud <laughs> pops through the uh through the small draped chamber you hear a i'm sorry we are closed for the evening so what's about for family. Mm. You look over <laughs> and you see a maybe her mid 30s, very attractive blonde woman dressed at the height of fashion, all blues and purples. Not unlike your own fashion sense, but somehow more put together. This is your mother. Grandmother, Jezebel, the gross mother hexa. Perhaps you would like to read my fortune, dear. Surely you get enough practice. She sits down, spine and possibly straight. They'll go on then, lay out the cards. Let us see what you see for me. Pythia drops like all the like smoke and mirrors. She just like shovels those cards, like real matter of fact. And she like lays them out and she says, oh, go ahead then. She picks one, two, three in order from the bottom. Pythia just kind of like prestidigitates them onto the table. <sighs> and she, she flips them over. Um, they all, first one. She flips over and it is, oh God, what is it called? I think it's called the crone. Yeah. She flips over the crone. She looks up and she says, well, you know, this is your fits. And then she flips over the second one and it's uh, the crone again. <laughs> and she flips over the third one and it's the crone again. And she's kind of like done a little bit of <clears throat> it minor illusioning to get them all to reflect the crown. Well, you know, I don't really think that my talents are needed here. Well, sir, cards never lie. Sometimes we just lie to ourselves. You are missed. That's a meeting. Why? What did happen? Well, it's time you became a sister. I've been a daughter far too long. No, I think not. I still have a few more centuries in me. Pythia, you are the oldest daughter. Well, it's the oldest daughter that counts. It's not like I'll be counting Eleanor anytime soon. Surely you don't want to stoop to that level. I don't need to. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. You know, it is difficult for someone in my position to have their own daughter refuse to coven. Dare I say, shameful. Sir, so you admit this is about you, not me? This is about us both. 
I see her. This is a family. This is a family that you are a part of, whether you like it or not. Surely you can see that? Even if you can't. Things are changing. Things are moving. We are not static. We cannot be static any longer. And I would wish you to be a part of them. Not separate from, not surprised when they do. A daughter of mine should be in the know. Mm. Well, then uh, why don't you call me in a couple of years when you have the next meeting? Perhaps. Perhaps. She stands. Thank you for the reading. No, what, Mama? And she looks back on you. There's a flash across an otherwise stoic face of somewhere between anger and sadness. And immediately it's gone. She stands up and walks away. Maurice hops down from the rafters again. You didn't tell her about the letter you received yesterday. Did you no. assume she already knew or? Maurice, I know this is a new concept for you, but uh, sometimes there are things I do not wish to tell my mother. I come from a long line of butlers, you should know, and obscuring information from one's superiors is never going to play out for you. I just want to warn you ahead of time, so that when it happens, I can look at you and say, I told you so. Yes, well, may that day come very soon for you. I fear it comes every single day. Ah, anyway, and she kind of like starts to pick up her things and put them together. And as she's sort of like getting her, her little outfit back together, uh, you can see that she kind of like looks in her little handheld mirror and like tilts her hat a little and it maybe changes shape to like reflect the uh, slightly more stylish silhouette that her mother was just wearing. Picking up your things, you collect your bag, um, and peering through the open top, you can see that open letter already, and tucked inside the envelope along with it, um, you can see are your tickets you've already acquired. The words of the letter ring through your head as you head towards the docks. To the illustrious Miss Crow, if you are reading this, I appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy one such as you often finds yourself without a free moment, and freedom is a valuable thing indeed. I have re recently come to suspect that you might be of great help to me in the coming days. Dark days are not coming, but are already upon us. I regret to say that your particular expertise will be of great assistance. And as for freedom, I have my suspicions that your final reason and necessary means are both in play here for severing certain ties to certain circles. Should you still wish to pursue such an action as previously discussed, and were I a betting man, I would wager that said reasons and means are locatable at the forefront of a certain venture I'm organizing. Should you wish to be a clandestine part, I invite you to Boston on May the 10th at the founding of the new Archaeological Institute of America. I hope to see you there. Though I'd be lying if I hoped the need for your expertise proves necessary. Professor C. E. Norton. As you head to the docks, you find the... Bless you, Marissa. Um, you find the ship that you have chartered as you step into line, organizing your bag with a ghostly crow, keeping within earshot, but somehow not visible to everyone around you. Um, you take a couple steps, adjust your bag, and whoop, into the back of an individual you had not seen. Clive, you feel a weight <laughs> against your back <laughs> as you sit ready to board this ship. Excuse me. What? <clears throat> What's that? Oh. Inspector. I'm Ms. so Crow. sorry, and she starts to like brush off his shoulders a little bit. That was my mistake. I'm so sorry. How are you doing? <clears throat> what are you doing on this boat? Are you on this boat uh, while I am on this boat? Hmm. 
Well, I... <clears throat> wouldn't think so, but... Stranger things have happened. What exactly are you doing here? I am on this boat to go to Boston. Boston. Hmm. Precisely where I'm heading. That's where um, this boat is going, so I would hope so. Hmm. Should be happening to go to Boston on uh, an invitation, or was it your spirits that have beckoned you there? Um, can I do a little bit of mage handing around the back to see if we can sneak a little letter out of a, a pocket or a bag or something? Would you still have the letter on you, Clive? Um, yes. Okay, go, go ahead and make a sleight of hand check. Uh, I would say disadvantage since you don't know where you're looking specifically. Damn, okay. Since I'm doing it on purpose, can I give myself guidance? Sure. But I believe guidance does have certain components, so Clive would know immediately what you're doing if you do. All right, just Adrian then. Stickler. Ooh, that was not good. <laughs> um, well, 17, but it wasn't a good roll. <laughs> Clive, you want to roll perception for me? Uh, should I just use my passive perception? Yeah, that's fine too. 26. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> How do you even get it that high? Mine's 22. You, this you bitch sense, took observant. <laughs> you sense a familiar sort of ghostly cold tingle down your shoulder, down towards a pocket. In fact, it's so obvious to you, it almost feels intentional. And then mm. you know what she's up to. She's, oh. This is not your first rodeo. Pythia, yeah. I know it's been a long time, but do try and keep your um, spiritual hands to yourself. <clears throat> of course. And it just kind of like poofs into a little wisp of smoke. My mm. apologies. But uh, yes, then I believe we are both here for the same reason. She'll just take out her letter and kind of like wave it around. Interesting. Well, I really shouldn't be surprised, but what is your relationship with the professor? I do not have one. Do you know him already? Oh, I mean, passing professionally, as it were. Professionally Maybe. is okay. We know each other professionally. Oh, more he was a client of mine at one point. Hmm. And Clive will, since she produced her letter, Clive will produce as well. Ah, I'm so. interesting. So we are partners once again in the Yes, we are occult. partners. Once again in the investigation. This is wonderful. And now we have the whole week on the boat together. You hear, all aboard! And uh, you see steam starting to pump out of the top of this liner. Pythia just like waltzes right up the deck and she yeah. says, ah, come on. Clive just kind of lets her pass and go ahead. Well, for one thing, Clive, it certainly won't be a boring trip. Whether that is to your benefit or detriment, we have yet to see. Mm -hmm. With that, we head back across the pond to a certain small town of New York City. <laughs> Oves clop on hard streets, beaten black by thousands of feet and clattering carriage tires. Voices shout gruff greetings and mutual curses as early morning dawns over Manhattan. Above them all rise the voices of those select individuals who know they must catch attention in a city of too much business and too many distractions. They must be louder than the hooves of the carriage horses, be more gripping than the most creative of insults. Or how else does one sell the news of the day than by catching the ear of those who inevitably know that headlines aren't enough to satisfy their curiosity? The newspaper boys run these streets and command the mood of New York City, even as they struggle to sell enough black on white to feed themselves. One of these, a bit taller than the rest, and crowned with a cap that newspaper boys all over the city know and trust, is the King of Criers, lower street leader in all things news and knowing, Paul. Will you describe your character for us? Yeah, he's a uh, short, scrawny paper boy. He's uh, got a pale complexion and black curly hair that sneaks down below the crown of his uh, uh, brown newsboy hat. Uh, he wears faded 
gray blue pants and a, a vest with a faded red collared shirt. Um, it looks like he sewn a few additional pockets on his pants and he wears a, a bright white cloth newspaper bag. Um, and yeah, sitting there tossing papes. And what's the headline of the morning? Uh, as he kind of stands on the corner, he's, uh, all right, listen, everybody, we got, we got a fire in downtown. We got a fire in downtown streak of murders in London. Uh, we got ah, a f- shove it. He's going to like pause for a second. Uh, it's not worth my time. All right, listen, we got a Florida man who gave birth to triplets. Y- y- you'll never, you'll never believe this. Come look, look at this thing. And he's actually going to take um, some marbles out of his pocket. Um, and he's going to like just oh kind of like hold them at the base of the paper. And he's going to cast. Um, sorry. He's going to cast. Uh, what are they called? Uh, dancing lights. Just just to illuminate the, the paper just a little bit as he like holds it up in the air and continues to. Uh, yeah. It's a trick you don't use often. You don't want to attract too much attention to yourself, but hey, here and there, it's not going to, yeah, it won't ruin anything. And it certainly does the trick as a number of people, whoo, like pulled off of their usual <laughs> straight line morning commute. Oh my God. Uh, you find papers start to sell like hotcakes. Florida man story is really pushing. Um, you know, <laughs> who's to say maybe maybe this sort of storyline might be more, more present in the future. Uh, this is certainly, uh, well, paper bait? Whatever the 1880s version of clickbait would be, uh, but hey. <laughs> now listen. Now listen. Listen. We got King Arthur's sword found in a construction site, uh, all the way up in Midtown. You'd never believe it. You'd never believe it. <laughs> way up in I think I heard about that. <laughs> and he, he yeah, page 32. Page 32. He knowing well well that it ends at page 17. <laughs> You see a number of people buying newspapers, looking for the spot, but before they're able to realize what you've led them on, you are gone into another street corner, <laughs> ready to do it all over again. So on cool. your fourth street corner of the morning, your bag of papers now much lighter and your bag of coins significantly heavier, you see a familiar figure, uh, a small newspaper boy, one of the youngest, uh, an orphan, you know. Uh, and his name is Willie Peters as he shows up to you, sort of rubbing his nose, kind of pushing grimy tears out of his eyes. Um, hey, know, what's, what's going on, Willie? You have something for... He, like, turns away and you can see that one of his eyes is uh, blackened. Not from dark circles, but from contact. Something for... For a headache? He's just gonna interrupt him. Willie, who did who did this to you? No, oh, it's it's you point fun. me in I the direction need... right now. Who did this to you? <laughs> he just hesitant and then feeling the weight of your presence just sort of points across the street, down a ways. It was Mr. Jenkins again. Uh do you I know, know do I know who Mr. Jenkins? You know, he he is what you'd call, um, or and what you and and Willie and the rest of the newspaper boys have termed a scrub boss, um, who sells the second hand of second hand rags, nothing of quality, um, and is far from official, um, and does have something of a reputation for um, certain forms of encouragement. Mr. Jenkins, it is you. But but don't tell him. I don't want him to do it again. No no no. I'm not going to say if, nothing. If, if it gets back to him, then it gets back to me. That I no no no. What what happened? No one explain, else will hire me. Explain the situation small. to me, huh? I, I didn't sell enough papers yesterday. He said I didn't get paid, and he said if I didn't sell enough this morning, then I wouldn't. He gave you a black eye because you weren't selling papers. Mm-hmm. Oops. I feel like Mr. Jenkins is going to get real sick. I don't know. I think he's pretty healthy. I, I don't know. I don't know. I just think there's something going around. Uh, I just feel like... Like what? I don't know. There's I, no he, stuffy nose or anything. It's, I, it's not stuffy nose. Maybe. He's going to eat something. You can just... just I've got some kind of premonition about it. I don't know. I, I, how many papes you sell today? You sold one paper. Oh, Willie. 
<sighs> what have you been doing? I'm trying to sell papers. How you show me your pitch. Hey, get get your papers here. He holds up one of the newspapers, and you can see it's definitely of Mr. Jenkins' quality. This is backroom printing. The letters don't line up. The headlines are splotchy. Uh, there's a reason this doesn't sell, and it's probably not Willie's fault, but the boy's certainly not helping. Get Willie, your papers Willie, here. Willie, stop. Murderer stop. Freed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a Murderer second black freed. guy. Stop it for a second, huh? Now listen, you got to... Uh, Mr. Jenkins, you know this paper's not going to sell. You got to make stuff up. You got to make it up. All right, I listen, I, I've been using this one. doesn't lie. Well, the news. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, Willie. All right, listen, come over here. Come over here. Come, and he's going to like lead him over to the corner. This is the one I've been using all, all day. It's been selling papers like hotcakes. Uh, okay. King Arthur's sword found in a construction site. Uh, you, you take your pick. Where, King where's Arthur's it? sword found in a, a site for construction. Yep. Yeah, yeah, where? Uh, Something that can roll off the tongue real easy. Saskatchewan. Uh, no, new choice. Timbuktu. All right, let's try London. All right, at least we're... I, I, London. I was bold. I, I did it in New York, but, uh, you know. We'll try London for now. All right, try this. Um, and uh, he's going to... Um, He's going to, like, slap him on the ass and then have him. But if uh, if it's all right, like, as he does this presentation, he's going to give him a flash of genius. He already okay. knows it's going to be bad. <laughs> Coach him through. Slap him on the ass. Uh, flash of genius is a plus five. Uh, yes. It's a... Uh... With the plus five, a uh, 13. <laughs> Get your papers here. <clears throat> Get your papers here. Sword found in stone in, in London. King Arthur's sword. Looks back at you. Did I, did I do it? I was good. Immediately, you see someone veer off their course. Um, maybe a, a, a middle-aged businessman. A bit distractible. Easy pickings for you. Something you could do in your sleep. He walks up to Willie. How much is the paper again? And he, um, it's it's it, just a nickel. Fishes in his pocket. Nickel. Takes the paper and leaves. Willie looks back at you. Eyes wide. I, I did it. Good job, Willie. Comes up. Comes up. Runs up. He only comes up to about your mid chest and wraps his arm around your leg. And thank you. Hey, you're welcome. We'll see you back at the... Well, you, I'll see you around town, yeah? Yeah, don't don't tell Mr. Jenkins. I won't tell him. We'll be fine. He runs off as he does. He was never the most graceful of children. A couple of his newspapers fall out of his bag, and as he squirms his way through the crowd, a bit more hope in his step. You see the newspaper lying at your feet, and indeed his cell was accurate, and you see in splotchy letters, now wet in the gunk of the street, murderer freed in question marks. In that rag is a headline, or a, following that headline is a, is a column detailing a man of suspected murder, uh, having recently been freed, and Mr. Alexander Allen, uh, who's been released on bail from an anonymous benefactor. Doesn't seem to attract too much attention on the street. Just a rag, after all. Is this... Is this the first time I've I've heard news of this? Yes. Alright. He's gonna, like... He's gonna, like, just look at the paper. And then just, like, toss it into the, the gutter. As you toss it into a gutter, you see a... Letter falls out from the pages of the newspaper. What is this? And pick it up and look at it. Bit stained with the wet of the ground from the gutter. A uh, bit of grime on one edge. And you see Mr. Moore across the back. Or across the front, rather. I'm gonna, like, just hurry up and rip it open and read. You tear it open. A couple people bump into you as they cross the street. Hey, get out of the way! 
and find a quiet corner. Good morning, Mr. Moore. I hope you were doing well this fine Manhattan day. Hey, hold on. Mr. Moore sounds nice. I hear the boys of New York are well within your care these days, and have little fear from the fear-mongering machines of the rich and the careless, and the poor and the far too attentive under your administrations. Unfortunately, my boy, there are worse things afoot than petty men and the strife they cause. Mysterious stories abound, and journalists, while interested, do a poor job of admitting what they do not and cannot understand. You know as well as I that there are terrors afoot, deaths unexplained, and horrors awaiting in the shadowed wings. I'm inviting you to the founding of the Archaeological Institute of America in Boston on May the 10th. I look forward to speaking to you and a few other contacts of mine about these happenings. I fear ignoring them is the worst we can do. And if I may sugar a bitter taste of a leave of absence from your home, I do believe that some developments had have occurred, perhaps with your mother. Not all is as it appears, and I would speak to you in person about such things. I have no guarantees, but hope is a flame that even the most powerful of darkness cannot, cannot overcome. Do not forget that. In all sincerity, Professor C. E. Norton. A professor? Reaching out to me? How do you know... How do you know about my... How do you know about my mom? And my... Nobody knows about the lab. All right. I'm gonna go to Boston. As you say that, a couple other boys from Crossway. Wait, you're going to Boston? Uh, it's just a visit. I'll be back. Now, don't you get any ideas about leaving us? Do you? It's, not your town. it's like you it's don't not even know me. It's not. It's like you don't even know me, huh? Of course, don't I'll mess be back up down there. And New York's gonna miss the the best paper boy in the in the South Side, right? <laughs> Please, just make sure uh, you're ready to fight for your route when you get back. I'm gonna reach down, and grab the uh, the soaked newspaper, and throw it at one of them. <laughs> On his face. All right, all right, get out of here. We'll watch over Willie. Thank you. All right, as you turn to end your morning short and start heading towards Boston, we pass on to our next character. <clears throat> the tale of the ghost of Oberlin is fraught with misinformation. Some say it's a tale of grisly murder. A student cursed to walk halls in which they were slain by a jealous academic rival. Others say it's a joke, told to frighten freshmen and leave the library open for the upperclassmen and the graduate students in the late hours. Except none of those ever set foot in the library when darkness takes the deep, unsettling liminal land that is Ohio. When the story began, the tale was far more mundane. An oddball dropout graduate student that kept to herself in the college library after hours. The truth, as it often does, lies somewhere in between. Only one individual knows the truth of the tale of the ghost of Oberlin, and that is the ghost herself. It's late winter of 1879, snow still clinging to the featureless landscape of Oberlin despite the pattering rain of an early evening. Between stacks of dusty books and streaks of moonlight peering through the tall windows of the campus library, risen early, it seems, sits a figure, hunched over stacks of open books, flipping through pages of several tomes at once. Bree, if you could describe your character. Yeah, so um, Cassie knows that it's nighttime, so not as presentable as she normally would be, which still isn't saying too much since she is barely presentable to begin with. Um, messy, curly brown hair is pulled back in a very loose bun um, and is dressed in what looks just like a white nightgown um, and currently has um, dark ink stains going down her both, both hands. Um, 
is very focused and intent on her work um, and is currently scribbling between probably two different notebooks right now, keeping her um, different projects separated. Like the 1879 version of far, far too many tabs open, you somehow managed to make sense of the work that you do. Um, describe to me what work is Cassie currently looking into? Um, right now it's looking into um, old fairy tales, probably more Celtic focused um, with the fair folk. Um, any stories of contact that people have had with the Fey folk over the years, um, deals, that sort of thing. Um, that's one notebook. The other one right now is many lines written and then crossed out and then rewritten multiple times, um, dedicated to, um, ah. The in-between spaces is what she calls it. Um, like a, a world beyond, beyond world where that hasn't really been um, discovered yet, but it's mostly focused on um, like occultisms that she's picked up over the years and uh, purgatories and that sort of thing. Give me uh, your choice, investigation or history check. And let me know which one you go with. Ooh, they're both good. It doesn't matter. Oh, we're going to say a, a investigation. That's a natural one for a 10, you guys. Let's go. Natural one. Okay. It's one of those nights that sort of drags on. Um, this winter evening, as night often does, it starts early and just keeps going. Um, by a solid 8.30 p.m., it feels your eyes are worn out, um, and despite the solitude in the library, you find that you are nevertheless exhausted. You've been able to find one tome, one you've read before a number of times. It doesn't provide so much as information as it does the philosophy of one individual. Um, there are a couple areas you've circled and copied over. Um, one, you find a passage. Um, these are collected writings. Um, you find a passage called A Treatise on Fear. Um, you read, Few individuals will ever know true fear. They spend their time afraid of little nothings. Bills to pay, people to impress, insurance, and banking and property management, and all the things humans have created to waste their own time. True fear is beyond them. Even if we expose to the black intent of beings beyond their knowing, their minds would snap, like a back unaccustomed to labor, suddenly placed under a heavy burden. In this analogy, most people are soft and untested infantile in their mental resilience it's not much to garner as you pass through i um, think as i'm reading i go to wipe the sleep out of my eyes but forget that there's wet ink there and i just smear it into my eye you find yourself blinking and you manage to get out what is in your eye as uncomfortable it is but entirely forget that there is a smear up the side of your face now as it has dried and well you've got things to read as you flip through and continue, you find another uh, passage. Um, the paper is mostly faded in this section, um, but the chapter further on in this same book is called Heaven, Purgatory, and Hell. And reading beneath, the, there's only one section um, that stands out amidst the blank spaces, and you see Heaven, Purgatory, and Hell. These are definite spaces, destinations for souls and beings to exist in alternate states. But definite spaces, notably, have indefinite spaces between them. For without indefinite, one cannot have the definite in comparison. Contrast is important, after all. For what happens to the book that slips between two cracks in the shelves? It is forgotten. It is marred by time. I propose that souls that do the... And that's where it ends. You close the book and set it on the stack of books beside you, realizing yet again you do not know that name. A certain Eliphas Levi Zahed, this mysterious author. Oddly, you look down at the notebook you were just writing in, and you see a letter sticking out of it. 
just gonna open that up. As you reach for it, a rat <laughs> lands on your hand. You see tentacles sticking out the back of this rat and bits of its flesh drip and goop onto your hand before vanishing in a tingling gas. Looks up at you and you see the tentacles sort of twitch. Give him a little scritch behind the ears and put him up on my shoulder. And climbs up on your shoulder, sort of rubs against you, that same goop tingling yeah. against your skin. Comfortable presence, if an uncomfortable tactile sensation. Since we're looking familiar. Yeah, it's my little buddy. Oh, God. My little baby boy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm going to... Yeah, I'll just open that up. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to cast Detect Magic and make sure there's not any weird enchantments or anything baked into it. Uh, you do detect an enchantment. Um, give me an Arcana check. Hey, new d20 this time. <laughs> Woohoo! Woohoo! Okay, much better. Um, Arcana is a 24. 24. It's an odd enchantment. Um, it is not an enchantment that would be considered, shall we say, standard. It is a letter that should not have been able to find you here. Though the Ghost of Oberlin is known, finding, well, the individual's name who's written on the envelope of Cassie Ellis should not be known. The enchantment attached to this letter is something of a homing beacon. It is something of a enchantment that finds whomever it was destined for or intended for. Ooh. Nothing terribly powerful, but practical hmm. with the right application. Gonna make a note of that for later. And you know, I'll reach into my pocket and pull out my letter opener and just dive right in. Smearing a little bit of ink on the envelope as you handle it, you pull open. I just uh, wipe that on my shirt. <laughs> hey, oh, clean, hand, clean hand is a working hand. Um, as you open it up, you see a letter. Miss Ellis. My deepest apologies for the odd delivery. It was the quickest that could be managed, though it lacks the decorum one such as you deserves. We have not yet met in person, though I have been aware of your studies for some time. Fascinating work. You really should publish. If you ever have any issues getting past the myopic gatekeepers of yesteryear that are dominate modern day editing, please do let me know. I would be honored to be in your corner in this regard. But I postpone my purpose. Your research is of a unique sort that, regrettably, is coming to be increasingly important to my own. I am putting together a field research mission, of sorts, and your expertise and intellectual capacity would be an invaluable resource in our endeavors. I entreat you to accept my invitation to Boston on May the 10th at the founding of the new Archaeological Institute of America, after which we will convene to a more private and purposeful company. With deepest hopes of your agreement to attend, Professor C. E. Norton. Ah, well, it gives me a break. Maybe it'll give me what I need to make a breakthrough. Thank you, Apollo. As you say, a break, there's a thought across your mind, which is, uh, you can't remember the last break you took. Unless you count dinner. When was the last dinner again? Maybe it was two nights ago? Hey, there's a lot of studying to do after all. Oh, shoot. You look down at your notes and see scribbled in the corner. You see showtime 830. Yeah. Okay. Close, close books, throw all of them in my bag. Actually, no, I go to throw all of them in my bag. Remember, I don't actually need all of them. Take out a few toss them on a table and then I'm just gonna book it out and make sure nobody sees me 
You book it out. I, I can only picture the the freshman student with the way too full backpack, head down, rush to the next class. <laughs> yeah. Walking at an angle. Yep. Um, as you step out into the cold and snow, it hits you as it always does. From the comfort and warmth of the library, a sudden bracing wet wind ripping across the flat land that is Ohio. As you bust out of the library, locking it with your key, uh, which inexplicably, inexplicably no one's taken from you yet, uh, you head your way across campus. Whispers, voices seem to follow you here and there, eyeing you, keeping distance. As you see people talking, pointing, and quickly is turning the other way. You head downtown. It's as fast as you can possibly make it without breaking into an entirely undignified jog, though you do that at some points as well. A certain rat bounding through the snow behind you, leaving boop, 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 little holes like a single footprint as it keeps up past you. There's also a trailing line of something melting the snow um, and a hiss of acrid smoke as it leaves its trail. As you round the corner, you see showtime, 8.30. You glance down at your pocket watch and see it is 8.29. That's the joy of procrastination. You always find the means to get there when you absolutely have to, and it's no wasted time. After all, you might not have found that letter. As you burst your way into the theater, you spare no extra glance, for you know who is playing tonight, or rather who is showing tonight. Your ticket is checked. You can hear shuffling and anticipatory whippers as lamps are dimmed simultaneously by the attendants of the theater as you rush towards your seat. Front and center, bought for you by the performer herself. With that, we head to our final character. Um, in the middle of the stage, you see oh, a... Wait, oh, wait. Just what? kidding. I got you. I got you. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I know where as, I am, though. Let's be real. As Cassie rushes in, those bright lantern lights outside reflect the rain that pools in those cobbled streets of downtown Oberlin. Recent rain heavy in the air. And a massive waxing spring moon. One Cassie probably didn't spare a glance for. The old woman could swear, women could swear they've never seen the moon so large as it is now. It seems to hang in the sky like an object, not a celestial body, but something you can reach out and touch. Inside the theater, red velvet frames the dark void of the stage. Voices drop to whispers as theater attendants dim those flickering lanterns. And one final not quite late, but really pushing it, individual rushes into her seat in the front. A voice booms through the black, no visible source. Please welcome to the stage the fantabulous, the incomparable, the undeniable Miss Charlotte de Montz. The black wood of the stage creaks under the weight of a polished boot. Mother died of violent magenta, polished and oiled to a mirror sheen. Voices hush to nothing, absolute silence hangs in the air. A snap of the fingers, a hiss of surprise from the crowd, as pink sparks light up the stage, orchestrated by the shadowed figure's ministrations, spelling out the phrase by phrase, what you see tonight will not conform to your expectations, tricks and lies, or truth yet undiscovered. That is for you to decide. Laura, if you'd like to describe the character. Ooh. Um, You see a very tall, very beautiful woman who's uh, got beautiful blonde hair put up in an updo. It's slightly too blonde almost um, with a very sort of chiseled features and high cheekbones, a little bit too high actually. Um, she's wearing this beautiful hat with maybe a couple too many frills and she has a parasol that she's lightly resting her hands on. Um, it's maybe a little bit too lacy and her dress is a very accurately described violent shade of pink um, with maybe a few too many decorations and baubles and flowers. And she smiles brightly, spreads out her arms and takes an enormous bow to begin the show. 
And what is your first trick, Charlotte? And I say, well, it's so lovely of y'all to be here tonight. I say Ohio's giving me quite the warm welcome. I have so many things with which to dazzle you tonight. Where shall I start? Perhaps, well, I, I think it's a little bit dim in here, don't you? Um, let me help with that. I will take off my hat and I will hold it up, sort of peer into it, show it to the audience. It's very short, not really small hat, a lot of lace, that's about it. And I look back in it, I'm gonna stick my arm a little bit too far in and I'm going to pull out an enormous chandelier using <laughs> silent image. And the image will float, like hover maybe five feet above me and just spread lights throughout the whole room. You hear what you expect, the oohs and ahs of a crowd that for the life of it could not figure out what you did. You know the faces to look for and the new light that shines. Uh, Typical gold tinged with pink as it illuminates the crowd. You know the faces, the ones that become more and more present day in and day out, those that are convinced you can figure out you do what you do. But you oh no, you're already a step ahead of them. They're never gonna figure that out. And as I wait for the applause to die down, the chandelier hovers for a minute and then all of a sudden it just crashes to the ground. And right before it hits the stage, it disappears in like showers of pink sparks and smoke. And I return my hat to my head. There's a scream and then applause as you play with emotions, you rise them up in panic and then bring them down in relief. You look through the crowd. That was good even for a warm up. Hey, over here. Yeah, right this way. You recognize a familiar voice in its own seat in a box, shadowed. Two green eyes staring at you from underneath an overlarge top hat. How's it going, niece? Having a good time? It's going well, as you can see. Hey, could you do me a favor? Anytime. Somewhere in your show, just uh, start a fight. Start a fight? Yeah. Any three Sorry. men. Any three men? Any of them? Yeah, they gotta fight with themselves. With themselves. Oh my God. Anyway, amazing. figure it out. We'll talk All after. Right. If you're successful. Alright. Alright. Well then, for my next act, I'm gonna need three strapping young volunteers. Do <laughs> I have any uh, any brave gentlemen here who would like to help me? couple hands timidly go up, some a little eager, some hesitant. You see two individuals who have been scrutinizing you, uh, perhaps two more critical towards the back, and one uh, perhaps on the eager side, um, looking at you with big eyes up towards the front that seem to be the, mo- seems to be the most enthusiastic that stand out to you. Uh, you're a little short, sorry. Um, yes, you, you right there. Come on up, please, thank you. And uh, I'll pick one of the one of the critical ones. Oh, okay. you've just been glaring the whole night. I think we better make your night. Come on up, come on up, please. Oh my and God. And I need uh, one more. Mm. I'll pick somebody who looks kind of shy. Okay. Um, you, the, the very eager individual does seem to be seated next to someone who's like, you can tell is in awe, maybe on the younger side, maybe like 18, 19, um, and is keeping his hands down, but is definitely enraptured. <laughs> And you just look like you really want to come up here, don't you? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Why don't you come on up? I know you didn't volunteer, but I can see it in your eyes. The crowd claps him along, and you can see his cheeks flush bright red as he picks his way up to the stage, sort of slips on the stair and catches himself. The crowd laughs, and they find themselves on stage, awaiting your instructions. Very good. Uh, I'll clap and have an assistant bring a large sort of same size as like a phone booth uh, box onto the stage. Okay. Now, if I could hand the three of you line up right here, please. Thank you. Just like that. The Thank critic you. kind of shoves the young guy behind him. 
Well then, you clearly want to go first. All right, I open the door. In you go, please. Oh wait, before you take a step in, please, if you don't mind, would you turn it around? I ask the assistant, make sure, make sure the audience can see all corners. They give it a spin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, now I open the door and I gesture, gesture the critic in. The critic kind of looks around. You can see he's feeling at the pains and like touching those. Th- kind of looks at you surprised, kind of taps on different pains. Seems to be solid. Oh, no, a little harder. Make sure. You make absolutely sure. I don't want any doubts here. Check the levers, buttons, you know, all, all the bells and whistles. You know, if there's something here, I'm going to find it. I'm sure you are. That's why I picked you. Searches around. It kind of delays the show, actually. Give him like a good minute and a half, but seems to be unable to find anything. Well, are we satisfied? I turn to the audience. I wait for applause. Oh, come on. Let the lady do her trick. <laughs> All right. In you up. go. He finally it gives up the pressing of the audience and goes in. All right. Now, I'm going to need you two to be on uh, either side, please. I'll put them on either side of the box. Um, you, sir, the shy one. Do you have anything on you that's um, very sentimental that maybe we could show the audience? It sort of nods and my, my grandpa's watch. You, you don't have to watch. hand it to me, but hold it up okay. so everyone can see. Holds it up. And make sure we turn it over. Are there any markings, anything uh, remarkable about it that marks it as yours particularly? My uh, grandpa's initials, JBD. JBD, everyone see JBD. All right, thank you. Um, go ahead and put that in my hat right here, if you don't mind. Will I get it back? Of course, of course. I won't have any stolen property in my show. Drops it into your hat with a bit of hesitance. Thank you. I put my hat back on my head with the watch in it. All right, and you, sir, on the other side of the box, do you have anything to contribute to this? Uh... Well, I got, he like reaches into his pockets, pulls out a couple coins. Ah, he pulls off his boot. I got a left boot. A left boot? Well, that's a, a little bit dirty. I don't really want to put that in my head. Do you have something I better? I got a sock. Yeah. Uh, so- no, actually, kerchief. that's a little bit. <laughs> kerchief, all right. Kerchief will work. Thank you. It's Ew. a bit, he holds it up. It's a bit used. Ew. I take it. Well, you know what? This is, I consider this an opportunity. I press to digitate it to make it clean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I take my hat off. I put it has it big in. eyes as, you, as he has, sees the clean handkerchief, but drop it in. Mm-hmm. I put it back on my head. And I come to the front of the stage. I turn towards the box and I hold out my hands. I make sort of this wave and a um, bunch of mist and smoke. Yeah, as this is going on, just from my curiosity, <laughs> I want to cast Locate Object on that pocket watch because I want to know where it is <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> what does um, she, what so does she learn, Laura? It's yeah, I just still in my hat. Okay, yeah, I just I reach into <laughs> like my bag and I start toying around with my um actually no sorry i have like a little brooch on with like a my arcane focus uh, and i just kind of rub that a little bit and i'm just gonna keep an eye on that pocket watch for the next 10 minutes (laughs) cool um hi so all this mist sort of surrounds the box and then drops and i walk over to the door and i open it and he's not there the crowd immediately, oh, whoa. And you hear someone from the back crowd, finally he's gone. Shh, he might hear you. Oh. Um, I close the door, I pull mm-hmm. off my hat, and the watch and the kerchief are not in the hat. To Bree, they are in the hat. Okay. <laughs> and I show the audience and the two men. 
ow, how'd she do that? How'd she? And the the guy on the on the stage, he's not gonna lose my wa- my watch. It's it's oh, coming back. Right? Don't worry, yeah. darling. I put it back on my head, and I open the door very abruptly and very loudly enough that he's she shows up again, and it's a little bit violent. Like it kind of makes him stumble a little bit. <gasps> Get your sorry ass out of there! What the hell you think you're doing, stealing these gentlemen's uh, belongings? That ain't very nice. I only asked you to take part in the show. Uh, okay, he like pulls his way out of the thing, and the guy who gave you the cursor is like, "Wait, he stole that?" Yeah, he did. Take your right shoe off right now. Takes his right shoe off. And when he does, uh, I'm gonna quick silent image a watch <laughs> dropping down onto the floor. <laughs> <gasps> the young shy guy tackles him on stage. Oh my god, this is so fucking funny! And you, yours is in the left shoe. It is. He uh-huh. jumps on, it, pulling it off, and you look up towards the stage as the crowd laughs and uproariously, and you just see two hands clapping in the shadows. It's fucking amazing. <clears throat> I don't approve of violence on my stage. You three get a hold of yourselves. Would you please look inside the box? And I open the door and both the watch and the the handkerchief are there. They're immediately reached for and the critic is like, is clawing his way off stage at this point. Seems to have gotten a black eye. Oh my God. Bleeding through his lips somewhere. (laughs) So funny. They gather their materials (laughs) and the, the youngest looks at you. Thank you. And like takes the watch and rushes off to the applause of the crowd. Incredible. But now I regret to tell you that this is the final show of the run. I know it's a little early. I promise whoever has spent money on more tickets will get their money back. But I unfortunately have business elsewhere. So I have one final thing to show you. And I walk, I'm going to pass by Bree and wink and, uh, or Cassie, sorry. And I'll walk out to the middle of the audience and say, I know it's old news now, people floating in the air. Masculine did it, Robert Houdin did it, but you know what, you haven't seen the way I do it. And I twirl to show that there are no wires or anything. And then I just throw back my eyes and they go kind of all milky white. I just like levitate into the air in the middle of the theater. Immediately the crowd the like top. pulls away from you, like the ones underneath you most directly are like leaning back and trying to like push down the seats to get away from you. And then when I reach like the top of it, I'm just gonna misty step to the balcony. As you <laughs> and <laughs> appear in a blast of magenta sparkles and smoke, there's, oh, where'd she go? <laughs> and you bring the spotlight onto yourself as the entire place erupts in applause. Oh my God. Good evening and good night, beautiful Ohio. (laughs) I take a bow, I leave. Not a bad end to the show. And Cassie, nice to see your friend do uh, as she does best or acquaintance at the very least. An hour later, you're both sitting over dinner uh, in a quiet favorite haunt of Cassie's, you being the guest to this town, Charlotte, um, eating whatever it is you eat post show, and Cassie eating whatever it is you eat when you find the time. Um, that what was you maybe a few tweaks to it this time. Did you like them? It's a little more violent than your last was. <laughs> I can't say I was expecting it. But... But, well, but did you like it, though? That's what I really wanted to know. Uh, um, Do you think the violence uh, added to the show or detracted from it? Hmm. Well, I mean, I can't say that it really affects me in my everyday too much, so I guess it was fine. All right. That's but, actually pretty hot praise coming from you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Appreciate that. The chandelier trick was pretty lovely. Thank you. Thank you. As the waiter comes by with your round of drinks, um, dropping them down. Um, Cassie, what did you order? Um, good question. 
Um, I don't know. Probably just like a really shitty salad. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Gotta fuel that research extra, somehow. Shitty salad, extra extra croutons. Gotta, yeah, gotta keep that blood sugar up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Books won't read themselves. Greens are good for you. That's all that she knows. Protein? No idea. Greens? Yes. <laughs> and Charlotte? Oh, well, I ordered the filet mignon, um, and <laughs> I will be completing that with a cheesecake at the end and also a glass of champagne. Incredible. As the waiter sets it down, uh, he sets down uh, a letter leaned against the champagne. Uh, and this is for you, Miss DeMonts. Ah, oh, thank you. I've been expecting this. I take it. Can I open it? You open it up and read it as Cassie picks at her salad, eating crouton by crouton before jumping to the greens. Miss, Dear Miss DeMonts, I do hope this letter has reached you in good time. This is but one of many, sent to the many places you have been rumored to perform. Be aware you'll likely be receiving this in duplicate multiple times should you be moving about these days. <laughs> I have conferenced with your uncle and he has directed me toward you due to your relevant expertise and knowledge of the intersect between the natural and the supernatural, if you'll forgive my use of such a biased terminology. I'm afraid I cannot share details of such a sensitive nature in a letter, but I do believe you're aware enough of whispers and rumors that make their way around certain circles. Pockets of shadow have been deepening the world over, and I fear both our current influence and the continuing expanse of their reach. I am looking forward to discussing this further detail with you in person. I invite you to Boston on May the 10th at the founding of the new Archaeological Institute of America. In humility, Professor C. E. Norton. Cassie, you immediately recognize the make of this letter that she's reading at the table. Well... I knew I was supposed to be going to Boston soon, but I thought it would be something more exciting than the founding of, what is this, Archae Archaeological Institute? I don't even know what this is. Yeah. Cassie, did you get yours yet? I received mine earlier this evening, yes. Which, I mean, I can't say I was expecting it, but I'm not one to turn down an opening of a very soon-to-be prestigious institute. Is that what this is? So this is a big deal? Yes. It's a very extremely big deal, yes. All right. I guess that's not too terrible. I mean, every, um, well, let's put it this way. Every opening needs a performance, maybe. Well, I Preferably guess... without, you know, attacking people next time, but... Oh, well, all right. I'm, I'm always looking for feedback, so I, I suppose I could leave that one out. <sighs> or at least if you're that. going to do it, maybe advertise it beforehand. But I thought the fun was that no one was expecting it. Anyway, I, it's okay. I get it. I get it. No fun. It's <laughs> fun. It's fun. Hey, uh, did you make any headway on my last book? Oh. No. It's a no. Nothing. Uh, oh, you little no. Bit. Hang on. Can I get that for you? I'm gonna wipe the ink stain off no. your face. Yeah. <laughs> Thank the, you. Surprising as the napkin comes away, how many, how much ink there was. Um, a bit more, and realizing you've walked been walking around and ordering food like this is, uh, it would be embarrassing, but Me. it's happened more than. More, more than maybe uh, it's happened to most people. Yeah. Um, yeah, no progress. I don't... Whatever ink it was used to print with was horrible. Did not travel well. It's gone. So now I need to look into whoever this author is. Maybe see if I can reach out somehow. Uh, but I don't know how long that's going to take. I don't even know who the man is. Who the man is? Y you mm -hmm. mean who the author is? Y yep. What's his name? Um, Eliphas something or another. Oh. Yeah. I bet he's mad at his parents for that one. <laughs> I try not to make assumptions. Hmm. Cassie, 
you um out of the corner of your eye you see remind me your familiar's name apollo apollo mm-hmm. um you see apollo twitching and then suddenly the like he's he's hiding in your bag people mm-hmm. for whatever reason they don't take nicely so to seeing apollo weird. um so you Unusual. tend to he tends to stay hidden out and out in public um you can see his eyes are a bit large and the tentacles have gone like not out of control but almost like spastic like restless like almost like restless legs just like jolting and then you feel it too the sort of sense of impending not doom but one's coming it's it's a it's a doozy of one um excuse me real quick um i'm going to get up grab my bag i'm just gonna run Ooh. Oh, thanks for coming. Bathroom. Bathroom. Just go. Okay. Uh, give me a constitution saving throw. We'll see if you can make it there. Constitution saving throw. Oh. See if you can make it to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, out of context. This does feel weird, yes. Um, ooh, this is fun. I'm going to use all my abilities to roll with advantage on that because that was also bad. Here we go. Um much better let's see so with that it's going to be constitution save as a 15 15 you make it just to the door and (laughs) black you feel your heart drop out from your chest almost like you're launched upwards but there is no up and there is no down you just feel your body drop away from you it's uncomfortable. It feels like tearing. Like tearing your soul out of your form. You feel surrounded by black. Surrounded by stars. Shifting. Distant. Certain. And as they always do, the visions start to come faster and faster and faster. Give me a perception check. Or, um, we'll say perception or an investigation. Um, we'll do investigation on that one for an 18. 18. The visions come quickly and they come fast and some don't mean anything and some do and it's impossible to tell the difference between them. That's the worst part about all this. Besides the fact that you occasionally collapse in public. Some visions don't stick in your mind either. Things that you recognize in the moment but later upon remembering are gone. Only four such visions, remember, that you see maybe a hundred as they just flash past you. You see a red moon and a young girl in a blood-spattered gown. Flash, a colorless landscape draped in the cloak of gray night. A church, blood on the floor. Flash, of torchlit black, of growling beasts and sunlight stained dark. Flash. A vision tinged red, of murderous intent. You feel your own desire to destroy something, to rip it apart. A blazing anger hotter than a hundred suns burning from within you, despite the fact you don't have a body. And underneath it, a sound like a loose bass string, hugged with a ragged bow. <laughs> Constant, steady, almost rhythmic if it wasn't so Then you blink and people are surrounding you. Should we get some ice? Is she okay? Get out of the way, get out of the way. This is my friend. Yes, somebody get some ice, please. You see Charlotte sitting over you. The inevitable headache that you know is coming before it hits and as it hits it hits like a truck the sweating begins the shaking of your hands all the symptoms that outwardly and inwardly tell you yep that was another one have i seen this happen to you before uh pretty do you have happened before with let's see 
And How long have you been in town? Uh, maybe like a month. Then yeah, I would probably say once or twice. Okay. I'll just hand, hand you some ice. <laughs> Put it on your forehead. Thank you. I do that. Push myself up. Um, sorry about that. I'm fine. I just need to lie down. Do, do you want? Do you want me to get a, a ride home or something? Um, e yes. If you don't mind. Um, yes. And then I'm gonna reach back into my bag, pull out a different notebook, and I'm just gonna start writing down what I remember. Those visions in particular do stand out, and as torturous as it is, you know you've already forgotten ten times as many. Yeah. But those lodge. Oh. The uh, inevitable Apollo sitting up underneath your chin on your shoulder uh, later in the evening does help both the comfort and the odd tingling numbing sensation from whatever goop drips from him actually does help with the headache slightly as you both find your ways eventually to your own beds and your rests looking forward to a coming trip we'll go ahead and paul i assume we take breaks okay cool we'll take a break how long is said break is that is that is, are we like a a five minute kind of group uh usually kind yeah of group? usually uh seven seven ish seven ish yeah. all right i will see you all back here in seven ish and we will pick up in Boston. Yay. yeah i do want to shout out really quickly again all of the beautiful wonderful art and the overlay itself was done by olivia Yay. who is playing Pythia. so thank you thank you olivia we are so thankful you have such talented mm -hmm. friends yeah mm -hmm. we do indeed uh with that We'll turn it over to you, Kiffer. <coughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Heavy fog rolls in on the morning of May the 10th. As you've each arrived by horse, by carriage, by ship, or perhaps by foot to the city, you've waited for the day. And as it rolls around, the weather seems to refuse to cooperate with any sense of impending meaning that you might have conjured for yourselves. Sitting outside, keeping an eye on the building, a rented hall just outside of downtown, scouting out, watching the patterns of those who walk in Boston. They walk wrong. They don't walk like New Yorkers, that's for sure. There's just something off about this city. Something just doesn't, doesn't feel like home. Speak for yourself. New York and Boston, what can you say? One individual does stand out, an individual doing much the same as you, that is, standing and waiting for this meeting to start, but not watching the crowd, at least not in the way that you do, keeping to herself. You see, dressed in traveling blues, a young woman, maybe 10 feet to your right, you seem to match eyes, and it's an odd sight to see brown and blue, one in one eye, one in the other. And we're, sorry, we're sitting where? Outside of the hall in which, or to which you have been invited, um, waiting for the ceremony to start. On like a bench in the hall? Or are we standing? Um, outside the building itself. Oh, okay. um, Underneath an awning. It's it's fogging and it's, it's cold and it's wet, um, but it's livable as you've simply arrived early to scope the place out. Alice is just sort of talking to herself. She's like, no, no. I'm doing it. I'm I'm doing this. I'm just gonna kind of like skip over a little bit. Hey, uh, who are you talking to? Me? What? You talking to somebody? Is it uh, reciting for something? You are you doing a speech in there or something? Um, y yes. I'm a I'm a writer. I was just going over dialogue. You know, 
I sell papers. You have a, you have a right for paper? No, nothing, nothing like that. What do you write for? Myself. Hmm. And he's just gonna like sit sit down next to her and wait. Can I read something? <laughs> uh, she like um scrolls through some pages and she sees like really nice cursive, which is her writing. But then on a few pages, you just see like curse words and like scribbles and just bad drawings and she's like um actually it's a it's a little personal oh i i understand i we didn't even introduce uh my name's nico and he's gonna <clears throat> and then like like polish his hand offer it she's gonna go i'm alice and she's gonna polish hers and <laughs> offer it back. <laughs> alice nice to meet you what what are you doing here what's your what's your business you live here? Um, no, I uh, I got a letter. Oh, you got, I got one too. And he's just gonna pull it out. Oh, we should probably uh, keep it a little. I don't know. Uh, feels a little uh, a little bit more top secret than we should. Yeah. yeah. She just like keeps hers tucked away in her pocket because she brought it with her. <clears throat> so, do you know? Any any more details about what this is? None. I'll be honest. I didn't even know. Aside from reading papers and and like putting stuff together uh, over over a, a long period of time, I didn't even know this was an actual thing. I thought sometimes I was making things up. Uh, I I and then all of a sudden, somebody's calling me to Boston, and and here we are. It's nuts. How, how old are you? I'm, uh, I think I'm 14. You think you're 14? Yeah, I don't know. It's I've been on the street for a little while. Uh, might have lost track. Right. How old are you? I'm double your age. Oh, you don't look a, a day older than uh, 19. She just smiles and laughs, and then in the back of her head, you just hear, ha, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you say that, the doors open across the street from you, several attendants um, opening up the doors, and you can see it's not just you at this point. There's a few others that seem to have been waiting in various areas around the street that start to trickle in. Over the next half hour, you enter into a hall where chairs have been arranged, um, balconies overlooking uh, the main floor itself, uh, at which uh, the front of which, or at the front of which, a podium has been placed. Um, the people who walk into this room are, for the most part, extremely academic. Um, you see older gentlemen primarily, um, and you hear talk of various studies into history and various uh, discussions regarding anthropology and sociology and you hear names of empires long lost and it seems everyone to some degree is interested in history we do note a few other individuals who do stand out um, a few fine dressed women who seem to have particular knowledge in this area um, though while maybe not employed as such do